Welcome to a presentation from the Nevada Department of Education. The Nevada Digital Learning Collaborative is glad to bring you the Planning with Digital in Mind video series, which is designed to provide valuable insights for adopting blended personalized learning. This is the second of five episodes in the series. The Nevada Department of Education is committed to making the transition to digital learning smooth for all. The Department of Education places Nevada students at the center of every decision they make. They are truly committed to seeing that all students succeed. Today, on behalf of the Nevada Department of Education, Kim Loomis will be presenting Shifting Pedagogy, Partnering with Digital Content. Welcome, I'm Kim Loomis. I've worked in the field of digital learning since 1999. I have over 20 years in the online and blended school setting, from teaching, designing digital content, professional development, and virtual school administration, to managing systems and processes for growing classrooms of the future. Let's get started. Before we jump into today's topics, let's define blended personalized learning. Sure, there's a formal definition with multiple parts as defined by research conducted by the Christensen Institute. But let's keep this simple. Blended learning takes the best of online learning and matches it with the best of face-to-face -face instruction. Think about the best of online learning. It's always available. It can be accessed anywhere. You get immediate feedback. Students can pick up where they left off. The data is rich and thick on each and every student. Think about the best of face-to-face -face classroom instruction. In the classroom, it's easy to read students' faces and notice if a student is not feeling well or had a bad night. We love seeing smiles and building relationships with our students. We have the ability to throw groups together for peer-to-peer -to -peer engagement and hands-on activities. Being a former high school math teacher, I like to represent things in simple math terms. Blended personalized learning is taking the wisdom of classroom teachers plus the intelligence of technology to add up to a personalized learning space for each and every student. Note the three icons, a teacher, a computer, and a student. They are all the foundations of blended personalized learning. Keep these three elements in mind as we move forward. Now, don't get me wrong when I say the intelligence of technology because it's really not that smart. It's just a bunch of zeros and ones, making it very easy to check answers and adjust a learning path. But it's also not taking home papers to grade over the weekend. As for teachers, your wisdom is so deep about instructional pedagogy, so much so that many of you have a master's degree. And we should never take the caring heart of the teacher for granted. As we kick off, it's important that we remember to focus on the core business of schools relationships, and learning. Even with the addition of digital content and technology as a tool for learning, we should never take the heart of the classroom teacher out of the learning process. A student's relationship with their teacher has important, positive, and long-lasting implications for both students' academic and social development. Positive teacher and student relationships draw students into the process of learning and promote their desire to learn. As for learning, maintaining high quality academic instruction creates opportunities for thinking and analysis, uses feedback effectively to guide students' thinking, and extends students' prior knowledge. When a student trusts that the teacher has their best interest at heart, they tend to be more engaged in learning, behave better in class, and strive to obtain higher academic levels. Let us not forget peer-to-peer -peer relations, and opportunities for collaboration and communication among classmates. Picture a student who feels a strong personal connection with their classmates, talks with them frequently using academic vocabulary, and receives constructive guidance and praise from each other. That's the power of relationships and learning. Let's take a moment to look at a typical classroom. Generally speaking, direct instruction may be the most common teaching approach in the United States. Since teacher designed and teacher led instruction methods are widely used in American public schools. The teacher is working hard delivering direct instruction 
using explicit teaching techniques to teach basic skills and concepts. It is time consuming with low rewards as it typically only provides low levels in Bloom's taxonomy or Webb's depth of knowledge or DOK levels one and two. Basic knowledge and comprehension or recall and reproduction plus skills and concepts. Teachers are working hard planning and deploying instructional approaches that are structured, sequenced, and led by teachers in lectures or demonstration format with embedded questions or activities that make sure that students have understood what they've taught. Yet, time is short, leaving little left for more than low-level basic instruction. Often teachers find themselves frustrated with the inability to reach all learners, leaving behind some and not challenging others enough. They are working hard and finding themselves tired at the end of the day, tired and frustrated. Students find themselves stuck in skill development and practice. This manifests in basic recall of information, such as facts, definitions, terms, or procedures. Typically, this is as simple as remembering a formula or following a recipe. It may require students to make informed decisions about problem solving and procedures, such as completing multiple steps in order to find a solution, like collecting and then displaying data in a chart. The low-level tasks have a single approach and a single answer, leaving students feeling bored and frustrated. It is widely understood that absenteeism has a substantial impact on performance. When the teacher is the only venue for instruction, students who are absent have little opportunity to regain missed instruction. Absences keep students from getting the consistent instruction they need to build on basic skills. Frequent absences not only mean less instruction, but also missed opportunities for intervention and reteaching, much less any enrichment that may have been embedded into classroom activities. Gaps continue to build, leaving them frustrated and behind. It's easy to see the common denominator here. Teachers tired and frustrated, students bored and frustrated, absent students left behind and frustrated. It's frustration all around. I'm sure you've heard this quote before. Students won't remember what you teach them. They will remember how you made them feel. No one wants to feel frustrated, not teachers and definitely not our young students. Bored and frustrated students are only one step away from asking themselves why to go to class, which may lead to more absent students. You may have also heard the saying, Students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Teachers instinctively care about their students. That's why we chose a teaching career in the first place. So we need to look for a new pedagogy that shifts classroom instructional practices. We care too much to continue feeling frustrated. To establish actively engaging classrooms, we need to release the tension between maintaining academic expectations while also supporting students' individual needs. This can be done by making a shift in pedagogy. It's not about adding devices to the classroom. It's about pedagogy and how you partner with digital content. By partnering with digital content, we can shift pedagogy towards an actively engaged classroom. Earlier, we spoke about how blended personalized learning utilizes the best of online learning. Digital content is great at delivering low level depths of knowledge and checking students' comprehension. It provides each student with a personalized learning space that allows them to pick up where they left off. It's easy for students to track their own success, set goals, and take risk in non-threatening environment. It's data rich with information on each and every student at our fingertips. It's like having an aid in the classroom, a personalized aid for each and every student. As teachers partner with digital content, they can shift their classroom pedagogy, releasing some of the classroom instruction to their digital partners. Teachers will have more time to create active learning activities, releasing the learning to their students as well, possibly with stations and playlists. As teachers redesign classroom instruction, they have the ability to guide instruction into more open-ended strategic thinking opportunities, using their depth and breadth 
of familiarity with the standards, guided instruction will span depths of knowledge levels one through three. Students now have the opportunity to take ownership of their own learning. It started with the release to digital content by the teacher, giving students the responsibility and freedom to learning independently. Also with that release, teachers open time to craft engaging peer-to-peer, -peer, higher order thinking activities, utilizing the four C's, communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. This will help fine tune habits of mind, such as flexibility, persistence, and risk-taking that will become necessary in life beyond school. In this setting, students are actively engaged in the learning process. As for the absent students, they now have resources for continuous learning. With an individualized learning space in the digital content, they can pick up where they left off. Peers can pull them up as they engage in peer-to-peer -peer explorations. The teacher now has time to conduct one-on-one -on -one instruction to push them up. All in all, they have the resources to catch up. In this environment, sharing the learning space with digital content, everyone is energized. No more frustrations. Learning is balanced between digital content, teacher-guided instruction, and student ownership much like the three icons in our definition of blended personalized learning. Taking the wisdom of teachers plus the intelligence of technology to create a personalized learning space for each and every student. Let's make sure we understand the difference between digital content and digital tools before we go much further. It's important that when we change our pedagogy, we go beyond replacing old habits with new digital formats such as a digital agenda, worksheets, and tests. A pedagogy shift is needed to think differently on how we partner with digital content and tools, transforming the learning with new instructional methods because we have new partners that can help carry the load. Those partnerships include both digital content, which can deliver instruction, and digital tools, which enhance classroom design or format. Digital content is curriculum in subject areas like math, English, and science, packaged as single learning objects, lessons, or a full course. It comes full, full of math, full of science, full of social studies. It has instruction inside. Open Educational Resources, or OERs, like Khan Academy and CK12 are examples, as are numerous vendor products. Digital content comes full. Digital tools come empty. Digital tools are used to create, organize, and manage classrooms, specifically for designing instruction and assessment. Google and Microsoft are digital tools. When you open a new document or slide, they are empty. Apps like Kahoot's, Quizlet, Nearpod, Edpuzzle, Test Teach or Blend Space and Go Formative are also tools. They are designed to create instruction or assessment within. Though some apps have repositories of teacher made products that you can utilize, but in general, tools come empty. When thinking about adding digital resources in your classroom, I like to recommend no more than one to three digital partners to keep the cognitive load down on yourself and your students. As for tools, three to five should be plenty. Don't go app happy. For example, you might use two digital content partners, such as vendor products or Khan Academy, and possibly BrainPop or videos from Crash Course for instruction. As for tools, you may enhance classroom design with four digital tools, such as Google Suite, Remind, Cahoots, and Flipgrid. That's a total of six different digital resources, two content partners, and four tools. That's a decent cognitive load for you, your students, and their families to manage. My mantra is less is more. Just use them over and over again, thus reducing the cognitive load. When we think about learning, we need to look at its underpinning structure. The foundation of every classroom is CIA, Curriculum, Instruction, 
and assessment. Just like a traditional classroom, blended learning classrooms are driven on the same three CIA elements, yet with unique qualifiers. Digital curriculum, guided instruction, authentic assessment. Imagine data generated every time a student interacts with curriculum in an easy to read digestible format. That is the strength of blended personalized learning, where digital curriculum delivers content requiring less stand and deliver instructional methods, providing teachers with time to analyze student achievement results and guide classroom instruction in large and small groups or work individually with students. And since there will be a traditional assessment in the digital curriculum, as well as in the classroom instruction, in the blended classroom filled with digital tools, students can stretch their thinking into authentic assessments, which require deep analysis, synthesis, creation, and peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. The CIA of blended learning can be represented by a triple Venn diagram, where each circle represents one element. In this diagram, icons are used to provide a visual cue for each CIA element, a computer for digital curriculum, a teacher for guided instruction, and a student for authentic assessment, each representing one-third of the equation. To learn more about the CIA of blended learning, check out the Nevada Digital Collaborative video in this series titled, A Blended Approach, the CIA of Blended. Our topic today will focus on partnering with digital curriculum. Digital curriculum can be thought of as a teacher's aid with significant advantages. First, every student gets one, an aid that is. When partnering with digital curriculum, students are exposed to standards aligned instruction in their own personalized learning space. This allows students to take ownership in their own learning by monitoring their own personal data, setting goals, and working hard to achieve them. Teachers also have data to drive individual and classroom instruction, knowing where one or many students are struggling. Again, digital curriculum is found in Open Educational Resources, OERs, like Khan Academy, CK12, or OER Commons. Many schools have purchased digital content through vendor contracts. Check with your school administrator or department chair for any digital content they are using or may be readily available. Typically, digital curriculum is engaging software aligned to standards, providing a personalized learning space and individual data points to help guide instruction. No matter how intelligent I say the technology is, it can only provide baseline instruction. It's great at providing low levels in Bloom's taxonomy or Webb's Depth of Knowledge, or DOK, levels one and two. Basic knowledge and comprehension for recall and reproduction, plus skills and concepts. Of course, that's not enough, but it's a solid foundation for teachers to build upon. Partnering with digital curriculum is just like partners you have in your home. We call these people our roommates, spouses, or children. Sometimes they don't put the dishes exactly the way you would like into the dishwasher, right? Well, the same will happen with your digital partner. It may not present content like you would, but that's okay. Think back to that dishwasher at home. Even though it was not loaded exactly as you like, most of the dishes got clean. And if you allow the digital curriculum to carry some of the low-level instruction, most students will learn. And for those few items that may need a little extra attention after the cycle wash, well, that's when we pull them aside and do some intervention, just like in the classroom. The best part about partnering with digital curriculum is that students can pick up where they left off. Better yet, they can take it with them, no matter where they may roam, thus reducing absences and gaps in learning. When it comes to digital content partners, just like modes of transportation, bikes, cars, trains, and planes, they are not all equal. You have to find the right fit, one that fits your needs and expectations. Knowing what type of digital software that you plan to use will determine the type of partnership you two will share. For example, if you partner with a skill and practice supplemental software, this may not provide any instruction. 
yet it can be used in a station rotation or as homework practice. This would leave you having to carry everything from filling gaps to meeting grade level standards. If you partner with adaptive software, one that pretests students or utilizes standardized assessment scores to create an individualized learning path, it can help fill learning gaps. Then you can focus on grade level standards. The third type of software consists of digital courses with a full scope and sequence of grade level content. Now remember that the instruction will still be at the basic depths of knowledge, low level comprehension, recall, skills, and concepts. Thus, you will need to scaffold the learning, stretching the learning to meet the appropriate standards levels, as well as supporting the learning with filling gaps and overcoming misconception. Selection of your digital partner should begin with knowing your needs and how the two of you can work together. Think back to that triple Venn diagram of the CIA of blended learning, digital curriculum, guided instruction, and authentic assessment. The three overlapping circles with the three icons, a computer, a teacher, and a student, which are the three key ingredients of blended personalized learning. Ideally, we're looking to reach that sweet spot in the middle. This is where the blended classroom has a balanced approach and a solid foundation in all three CIA components of blended. Let the digital curriculum do what it does best, deliver low-level knowledge at DOK levels 1 and 2. With all its zeros and ones that make technology so intelligent, it generates so much data. It's that data that becomes important in the new pedagogy shift. Teachers must take this data to guide classroom instruction. It will tell you who is on pace, who is understanding and what they're understanding. Who needs more one-on-one -on -one time with you? Or if the whole class needs additional scaffolds and supports. This data is rich, so use it to your advantage. Think of it this way. You have partners at home. We call them spouses. You wouldn't let them sit around all day watching television with their feet up on the coffee table. No. You would expect them to work and bring home some digits, a paycheck that can be used jointly for the better good of your home. The same is true with digital partners. Don't let them sit on the sideline, collect their digits, the data, for the better good of your classroom instruction. It's a partnership working together, intertwined, not two separate distinct silos. Matter of fact, I like to say it's like a dance you and your digital partner moving together. Sometimes you lead, other times the digital partner leads. Without the data, there's no music, no harmony. Having core data practice knowledge and skills are essential to becoming an effective blended teacher. To introduce data practices, we will first discuss the concept of mastery-based progression, which is often the foundation of digital curriculum products. Mastery-based data focuses on student performance rather than seat time to determine how students progress through digital curriculum. Students demonstrate mastery of a skill or topic before moving on to a more advanced one. For an assessment to be useful for mastery-based progression, each element is associated with a specific student learning outcome, or SLO typically a single standard or objective. In some software products, rather than focus on overall scores for quizzes or exams, scores are typically displayed at the SLO level. Mastery dashboards or gradebooks typically come in street-like colors, green, yellow, red, and may include various shades as well. Green indicates a student has achieved a mastery level on an assessment or SLO. Yellow indicates near mastery and red indicates that students need more significant remediation or intervention. These visual representations help teachers quickly recognize individual students who exceed mastery, meet mastery, are near mastery, and those who are below mastery and need remediation. Mastery-based progression is better 
for students learning than time-based progression. However, it requires a skill set that may be new to you. Student data will help you and your students both know when they are ready to advance to a new concept or skill. Good data practices also provide insight into specific student deficiencies so that you can provide targeted interventions to help students overcome these deficiencies. There are two major types of data that are typically used to monitor student growth and therefore usually available on data dashboards. Performance data is student achievement data. It represents direct measures of student learning, such as how students are performing on assessments. Activity data is student behavior data. These are indirect measures that often help explain student learning patterns, such as participation, effort, engagement, and activity levels. Both types of data are important to understand the story of student learning and growth. While data dashboards are helpful for presenting large amounts of student data in visual form, you must develop the skills of interpreting student data and using the data to improve student learning. Interpreting patterns in student data is the process of reading and trying to understand the story that the numbers tell about a student's learning growth without having all the narrative details. Data can be an intimidating topic of conversation for many reasons. One of those reasons may be that the data is often used in a context of reports and analysis of measurements that might be unfamiliar to us, such as predicting weather patterns, the stock market, or sporting event outcomes. Yet, in generality, using data has one central theme. It tells a story. Given numbers, and based upon those numbers, data tells a story. The numbers help us to see patterns and use those patterns to predict what might happen next. Within education, we use the term data to determine where students are in their understanding of learning objectives, why students are where they are, and how we can help them get where they need to be, and when they're finally there. In other words, data helps us tell the direct story of student achievement. When looking at data for your digital partners, try using the triple A process. Step one, ask. You should always begin with identifying a question that you want to ask of the data. This initial question is often focused on, on understanding patterns related to an individual, a group of students, or even the instruction itself. For example, why is the student struggling? Step two, analyze. The second step of the process is to analyze the data for patterns that can help you answer the questions that you've asked. Coming back to our struggling student example, you might ask, are you seeing a difference between classroom observation and digital assessment data? You could check the activity data. Is the student jumping all around or just clicking through? Step three, Act. Finally, you need to act on what you found. This typically entails adjusting the student learning activities, the instruction or the assessments used to gather data. Again, from our struggling student, observe the student watching the instructional videos to see if the language level is at too high of comprehension. Pair mastery and near mastery students to practice together or Conduct one-on-one -on -one tutoring with the student. Ultimately, you will want to become familiar with the data dashboards that are available in your digital partners. You will need to know where to find the performance and activity data for your students so that you can look for patterns to pull out the story while applying the AAA process of ask, analyze, and act. Monitoring student performance and activity is pointless if we don't plan to act on what we've learned from our digital partner's data, or if we provide the same instruction to every student regardless of the story the data tells. Once you understand the story of students' data tells, you can conference with that student to help them take ownership over their own data. When trends in data are shared with students, you and your students can work together to co-create learning expectations set goals and steps for success.
including a timeline for completing those goals. Here are a few essential data talking points when conferencing with students. One, where is the student currently? Two, where does the student need to go? Three, what can the student do to get there? Four, how quickly can the student complete the plan? The goal is to have students take ownership over their own learning data. Of course, in order to do this, students need to not only have access to their own data, but they also need to understand how to read it and recognize its trends. You might want to share the AAA process with your students to help them ask, analyze, and act upon their own data. Personalization consists of a system of mindsets and practices that allow teachers to increase a student's chance of engaging with learning materials, mastering the materials, and applying them to the real world. Blended teaching allows us to shift from teacher-led practices to a more student-centered practice that gives students power over their own learning journeys. Technology has made it easier than ever to make learning personal. The rich data within the digital partners will make it easy to set expectations for student ownership and goal setting. Utilizing one-on-one -on -one conferencing will reinforce the student's ownership with helping them to determine steps towards progress and celebrating those successes. It also builds upon student and teacher relationships, drawing out that human heart that the technology could never replace. When partnering with digital content, teachers can balance and enhance learning activities. Student-teacher activities involve the most valuable and limited resource within your classroom. You, the teacher. In a blended classroom, you want to use your time and skills to maximize potential. This means doing what you do best, encourage and motivate students. When you identify an individual student or small group of students who need remediation in the red, in a mastery grade book, it is often effective to conduct a one-on-one -on -one or small group tutoring session because you can diagnose more nuances challenges than the software can. Student-student activities involve options such as peer tutoring and small group peer teaching and collaborative projects. Peer tutoring and small group teaching activities work best when students are near mastery or yellow, but probably do not work as well when they are in need of remediation in the red. These types of student-student activities not only help the students who are near in mastery, but also help the peer tutor develop communication and collaboration skills. Peer tutoring or small group work can even keep students on task if they're paired with the right peer. Student to content activities are activities students complete from a teacher curated playlist or activities recommended by an adaptive learning software program. Some software makes it easy for you to recommend learning activities based on individual student needs. For example, Khan Academy allows you to manually assign practice problems to students in each skill area based on students' needs. Recommending curated student contact activities is a particularly good option when you already know that the student's weakness matches with existing activities. It can also be a good option for students who aren't near mastery in the yellow and just need a little more practice to achieve mastery. Data from evaluations are split into two major groups, summative and formative. Summative assessments are usually given at the end of a unit, course, or school year, and are often created by someone other than you. Formative assessments are typically shorter, more frequent, and diagnosed in purpose. They provide specific guidance to students and to you on what your students still need to learn you will develop a wide range of formative assessments for your blended personalized classroom. Among this range is the variance of online versus in-person evaluations. Both types are central elements of effective blended teaching. Administering assessments online and in-person have different advantages that should be considered 
as you are planning instruction. The key is balance. Think computer, teacher, and student. Balance the three elements of blended personalized learning, digital curriculum, guided instruction, and authentic assessment. The three icons, computer, teacher, student, in the CIA of blended, remind us of the balance needed for a pedagogy shift to blended personalized learning, where teachers partner with digital curriculum so that they can guide instruction with higher depths of knowledge and students can take ownership in their learning while engaging in authentic assessment. Think of thirds, plan in thirds. One third digital curriculum, partnering with digital content to deliver low level basic instruction, which in turn frees the teacher up to provide more one on one and small group support. One third guided instruction, utilizing the wisdom of teachers to ensure that students grasp the appropriate depths of knowledge of the essential and power standards, moving beyond DOK level one and two into strategic thinking, which includes whole and small group instruction, as well as crafting thought-provoking peer-to-peer active engagement experiences. One-third authentic assessment and student ownership. Move beyond traditional quizzes and tests. Embrace peer-to-peer -peer experiences with the four C's, communication, collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, this may also include performance tasks and project learning. Today, we explored a new mindset for partnering with digital curriculum to create balanced learning environments. Partnering with digital content will take a pedagogy shift, one that thinks in thirds, one-third digital, one-third teacher, and one-third student. So you may be asking, how do you plan with digital in mind when partnering with a digital content? It starts with understanding that if you, the teacher, will lead one third of the time, that means two thirds of the time, you will release control to technology and or your students. So we better know our digital partners inside and out. When using the CIA components for designing instruction, teachers should look at all three components and focus on units of instruction rather than on individual lessons. This will lay the groundwork for learning over time and ensure a one-third balance across the unit of study. It will be challenging to move from a single focus teacher delivery system to one that releases instruction to digital content partners for delivering low-level basic learning opportunities. The payoff is the data that is gained for each student as well as the whole class, which will help guide instruction and open opportunities for authentic assessment. First, tackle digital curriculum. Planning lessons in the blended classroom begin by knowing what's inside the digital curriculum so that the classroom teacher may complement it. Teachers need to preview the digital curriculum and identify what students will be expected to know and be able to do. There are too many blended classrooms where the teacher has no idea what was going on in the digital courseware. This would be like planning without cracking the textbook or reviewing the standards and flying blind. If teachers do not know what's in the digital courseware, how can they predict where students will need support and guide instruction? They cannot wait until the students interact with the digital curriculum and the data sends up a red flag Teachers need to plan ahead. Start with identifying what is in the digital partner and tasks students will be asked to complete. Remember, digital partners will only provide low level DOK level one and two. Move to guided instruction. Once teachers know what's in the courseware, they can plan for guided instruction. They will need to identify prerequisite knowledge and where students will need scaffolding. These topics could be used as classroom openers to set everyone up for success. Teachers also need to identify where students might have misconceptions or areas that are troublesome. These topics would be ideal as class closure activities 
to reinforce the learning. Courseware digital activities like discussions and pre-test materials can be done offline in small and large group settings. Remember, it's a blended classroom. Blend the instruction too. Teachers will also need to identify resources they can use to represent material, especially for students who need to see it in multiple representations and require extra practice. Resources can be used in a one-on-one -on -one or small group setting for struggling students. From intervention to strategic thinking, guided instruction will span DOK 1 through 3. Wrap up with identifying authentic assessment opportunities. Teachers need to look for engaging opportunities that will stretch students by demonstrating mastery of concepts in creative, critical thinking, and collaborative ways. They should identify peer-to-peer -peer active engagement activities, performance tasks, and project learning opportunities to expand and extend the learning. Peer-to-peer -peer activities may start in low-level skill sets and extend into higher order projects that expand thinking, touching DOK levels one through four. Please know that digital resources for instruction, practice, and feedback cannot and should not completely replace teacher-led instruction, but they can lighten the teacher's load with proper planning so that teachers can focus on areas where their personal instruction and their person-to-person -person connections with their students are most needed. With the right digital partnership, teachers can find ways to focus in on both high quality academics and establishing positive relationships with and among their students. This wraps up today's episode of Planning with Digital in Mind, which was the second of five in the series. Look for other episodes to continue learning about how to embrace the CIA of Blended as you adopt a balanced approach in your classroom. Thank you for your time. It has been a pleasure serving you. This presentation is available on the Nevada Department of Education's YouTube channel. Come back to it anytime, and please feel free to share it with fellow educators.